My name is Jim Fleming, and this is Our Sunday School. Our Sunday School is part of Stewart Heights Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. To prepare for this lesson, please go to OurSundaySchool.com for a copy of today's handout. Now, let's get to this week's lesson. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Our Sunday School. Glad you guys are with us this morning. So we're in Philippians chapter 1. Trending toward two, but we're still in chapter one. Uh, last week we finished up with verse 17, so we'll start this week with verse 18. I uh, believe we can get through 20 today. We'll see. But uh, let's go ahead and start with our reading of Philippians chapter one. So I'll read through chapter one. Feel free to listen or read along. And, uh, we'll go from there. <clears throat> Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you, always praying with joy for all of you in my every prayer because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Indeed, it is right for me to think this way about all of you, because I have you in my heart, and you are all partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how deeply I miss all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And I pray this, that your love will keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of discernment, so that you may approve the things that are superior and may be pure and blameless in the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually advanced the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is because I am in Christ. Most of the brothers have gained confidence in the Lord from my imprisonment and dare even more to speak the word fearlessly. To be sure, some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. These preach out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, thinking that they will cause me trouble in my imprisonment. What does it matter? Only that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice because I know this will lead to my salvation through your prayers and help from the Spirit of Jesus Christ. My eager expectation and hope is that I will not be ashamed about anything, but that now, as always, with all courage, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, if I live on in the flesh, this means fruitful work for me, and I don't know which one I should choose. I'm torn between the two. I I long to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Since I am persuaded of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that because of my coming to you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus may abound. Just one thing, as citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or am absent, I will hear about you that you are standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel, not being frightened in any way by your opponents. This is a sign of destruction for them, but of your salvation, and this is from God. For it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are engaged in the same struggle that you saw I had, and now hear that I have. Philippians chapter 1. Now, I'm going to go ahead and start this morning and play my hand at the beginning and tell you what I think the right way, the right lens to look at today's particular text is. But there is a hinge word in this text. So today is 18 through 20, so he's, he's just talked about the, the Christians that are proclaiming Christ for good motives, the Christians that are proclaiming Christ for bad motives, so what does it matter? Only that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice. W- which all sounds great, right? Everything sounds good so far, and probably none of your theology like uh, sensors are, are dinging at this point. And then the next line, because I know this will lead to my salvation, 
through your prayers and help from the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Did anybody's, did anybody's like, wait, what? What did he just say? Was there a, a, wait, what about that? Paul, I don't know. Check your theology there, Paul. What word? Salvation, Salvation right? Yeah. So, so let's talk about words for a second because we're going to get to this word. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to lean a different direction than the, than the way that the CSB has translated this. Because salvation has a broad range of meaning in a lot of different ways. Salvation can be, I am saved for eternal life to, I am hidden with, uh, in, hidden in Christ in, uh, hidden with God in Christ. I am uh, redeemed. Uh, salvation can also be, I had an accident on the side of the interstate and the firefighters pulled me out before there was a cinematic explosion of the vehicle, right? So what is Paul's immediate context? He is writing this from where? From prison. And what's his next, like on Paul's calendar, I'm, I'm not talking eschatologically here, all right? On Paul's calendar, what is the next event that Paul is immediately facing at some point in the very near future? He's facing a trial. That's exactly right. He's got a trial, and he's already mentioned that um, it, he's, he's talked about how um, because of my imprisonment, most of the brothers have uh, gained confidence, uh, others proclaim Christ. So he, he's talking about all these people that are around him immediately right now. And then in verse 21, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Now, if I live on in the flesh, this means fruitful work for me. In the immediate context of his trial, what are the two most likely outcomes? Like, at his trial, he could either be declared or innocent. Right, guilty or innocent. If he's declared guilty, what happens? Right? If he's declared innocent, he's free. Read verse 21 again. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I think that is the immediate context of what he is talking about. I'm going to lean in and push that this word salvation, if you look at your footnotes, if you look at your footnotes in your CSB, there's another word that the CSB says, hey, this could actually be a different word. It could be vindication. If he is declared innocent, then he is vindicated in the eyes of the Roman legal system and is declared free. Now, have you ever heard somebody say two things at the exact same time? Communicate more than one thing with the words that they are saying. Yeah, Did, have you ever read the words of Jesus where he was talking to his disciples and he was also talking to the unbelievers and he's talking to those who are attacking him and he's also communicating with us. He's an unbelievably rich, theologically dense communicator. I'm going to leave open, even though I think that Paul is leaning toward this is, the, this is vindication, innocence in a legal sense. I'm going to leave open the idea that he could actually be talking about both. Both his salvation long term and his immediate vindication in the eyes of Rome. So I don't typically like to state assertions before I teach a lesson. I like to let the lesson lead us through that. But it's going to be hard for me to like, hold my breath that long because I need to lean into a couple of things. But I want to show you both sides of it as we go through. Now, I will tell you this. Every commentary I read this week uh, or last week uh, either explicitly stated or strongly implied that Philippians 1, 18 through 20, because it's one verse in the Greek, like all of that's one, like welcome to Paul, <laughs> right? Uh, is one of the most complex verses in the entire New Testament. Like, so it's just, this is really, really hard. So what do we do when we know we're walking into something really complex, really difficult, and there are differing opinions? Do we strangle our belief system and say, we're going to hold on? No, I want to I hold this a little more gently. Okay, so we'll push into that as well. But we're on page 65 if you've got your green books. So let's start there, and we'll kind of, we'll go from there. All right, so verse 18, what does it matter? What does it matter? So we've got, uh, this is really just two words in the Greek. It's, uh, uh, it's basically so what, or for, or for what. Um, only that in 
every way. So, so what does it matter? So he's just talked about you've got, you've got believers that, um, this is what happens when I run my own PowerPoint. I'm always on the wrong slide. So if it appears that I'm on the wrong slide, then I'm, I'm probably on the wrong slide. Um, so, so what does it matter? So does, does Paul say everything is catastrophically lost because we've got people preaching Christ from the wrong motive? No, he actually says the opposite, right? Now, I, I'm gonna, I get to use my Brian voice for just a second. Don't hear what Paul's not saying. Paul is not saying somebody has corrupted the gospel and that's fine. Like you, we should read more Paul if you think he's going to let that go. Like this is, <laughs> that is not Paul's style. He has not mellowed out in his old day. No, 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 no. If anything, he has leaned further into the gospel and clarifying exactly what this is. This is this, these brothers that are preaching Christ are not coming at it from a, uh, from a Judaizer perspective where you have hey, you need to keep part of the law to be part of Christ, or hey, you need to have some kind of special knowledge to be part of Christ, or hey, you've got to do some other... No, no, no. They're preaching a good, solid gospel of Jesus Christ. So because they are, he says, what does it matter? So an application here, and some of you are not going to like writing this. I don't know that I liked writing it. Some reasons don't matter. I think I said this last week, but the only pieces that God has to work with are broken ones. And like we're never going to get all the motives right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to age myself for just a second. Did anybody grow up watching Friends? Did you up watching Friends? There's an episode of Friends where Joey is like trying to do something truly altruistic and has like, you, you know the episode I'm talking about? He's like, I want to do something truly good for just for good's sake. And Phoebe comes at him with some version of, yeah, but don't you feel good about it? Yeah. No! <laughs> like, we're never going to nail every motive, every, like, that's just not happening in our broken, sinful bodies. Uh, there might be glimpses here and there, but, like, this is not going to be a consistent thing that we do on a regular basis. So I'm, I'm grateful for that, that, that God still uses us despite that. So application is some reasons don't matter. So what do we do? Focus on Christ proclaimed. Re rejoice in the fact that someone's proclaiming Christ. This is good. This is really, really good. Because if the entire gospel were dependent upon Paul's life and ministry, then, then the hinge, hinge point for Christianity is somebody other than Jesus. Okay? And same thing's true for me. Like the entire gospel is not dependent upon me getting our Sunday school lessons right. I am so grateful because <laughs> God did not design the universe that way. It's a really bad fail point. So. So let's keep going. So what does it matter? Only that in every way, I'm on page 66, whether from false motives, this is a, this is a bit of a, a goofy word. I don't know if I could say goofy about the Greek language, but it's a bit of a goofy word. Like it's a, a pretext, uh, a fakeness. Um, it's, a, it's not the word hip for hypocrisy, but I would say it's a first cousin, kind of a mindset, if you will. So whether from false motives or true, Christ is proclaimed. So whether, whether the, the idea is bad here, whether the idea is good here, Christ is proclaimed. Uh, and Dr. Fee is talking about Paul, and he says, here's one for whom the gospel is bigger than his personal role in making it known. Is Jesus bigger than my reputation? Yes. <laughs> is, like... Dr. Fee does this every once in a while. And this will be buried in the middle of four pages of like deep, intense Greek analysis that I catch every 12th word or something. And then he'll throw this in and you're like, well, can you write a book just of these? Like that would be so much more efficient, Dr. Fee. But I don't think he can. That's not his style. So it's okay. All right. So whether from false motives or true, Christ is proclaimed. I'm on page 67. This is the same word Paul uses back in verse 17 when he talks about the false motives. The, the proclaiming of the false motives there. And in this, I rejoice. So can I, I'm just going to double down one more time. The word for rejoice means happy. The Greek word for happy means rejoice. There's not a spiritualized version of happy that means joy, no matter how many times you hear it from anybody. That's just not the way the words work. It just means happy. 
<clears throat> it's not if you're happy about Jesus, then that's joy. No, it's just you're happy. It's okay. It's really okay. If you can tell I get aggravated about this, I do. All right, so this is a present active indicative. So this is a, a repeated right now occurring statement of fact. Uh, he is happy. And if you look at how many times rejoice shows up in Philippians, it's a lot. And that's just the verb form. The noun form shows up a bunch of times too. And there's a couple of words that are about first cousins to this as well. Joy shows up. It's a, it's a major theme of, of, uh, of what is going on here. Uh, Martin and Hawthorne have a great kind of extended quote about this. He says that the how of preaching is not the object of Paul's joy. Right? So can we just, so like don't read anymore yet. Like the how of preaching, like our favorite preachers are not the point. The message of Christ proclaimed is the point. So if somebody's got a style that you like a lot, so what? Paul literally just says, what does it matter? Those motives, that's, like that, that is not the point. The fact of the preaching is Christ was just proclaimed. This will cause us to rejoice. This is good. So for when the word of God is preached, it overcomes all hindrances and moves us on to its goal. Its contents are irresistible. The power of the gospel, therefore, does not depend upon the character of the preacher. Can you point to any, any, is that not beautiful right there? Like this is encouraging to me. <sighs> Can you point to any preacher in scripture other than Jesus that had a flawless character? Like, nope. So this, like, like, humanity is like batting zero up to Jesus. <laughs> and then we batted zero after Jesus. Like, there's nobody that gets all of this right, not even preachers of the gospel. Oh, this is so liberating to say. Um, it's just beautiful stuff. And then there's one more. So uh, Dr. Hansen came in. He said, the advancement of the message, not the advancement of Paul, is the source of Paul's joy, which is kind of another way of saying the same thing. Are we okay with this? Like this, what is, this sounds an awful lot like he must increase and I must decrease. Right? This idea of like, it's actually all, when we say it's all about Jesus, we really mean it's all about Jesus. It is not about the messenger. And when the messenger, I'm going mm, to get ahead of myself here. All right, let's get back to the text. And in this, I rejoice. That's a present tense. Yes, yes. This is like the, almost like the preacher saying amen to the preacher. <laughs> Have you ever heard somebody here say this? So the application in the bottom of the page here, the gospel is more important than those who proclaim it. The gospel is more important than those who proclaim it. Now, I don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that humanity is not important. Humanity is who the gospel is for, right? This is the object of... Uh, not the, uh, it's not the object of the gospel. There's the, the target of the gospel. Um, so what do we do in this? Rejoice in the spread of the gospel. I, I save you guys from all of my mathematical equations that I put in my notes myself, but I'll tell you this one. I have message is greater than man in my notes here, which I think is kind of like a distillation of this. I mean, there's parts of the New Testament where preaching is called foolishness, right? <laughs> like it's, it's crazy, right? So application, the gospel is more important than those who proclaim it. So what do we do with that? Rejoice in the spread of the gospel. Rejoice in the spread of the gospel. Did I help you out there, Ms. Linda? Yes. Okay, good. Hand motions help me know quite a bit when I have gone too quickly through something, so keep them coming. <laughs> All right, so yes, at the bottom of page 67, top of page 68, and I will continue to rejoice. So what, like there's, a, there's an inflection point here. So Paul moves from, I'm looking backward at what has happened, and now he's transitioning to, all right, I'm, I'm going to start, I'm going to start looking forward. This is a, this is a, there's several of these in this text, and this is a goofy uh, parsing. This is a future, so it's happening and talking about the future, indicative, statement of fact, and it's passive, Which means it's, yes, thank you, Jessica. That's exactly right. That's what my head went. I was like, what? Passive? How do you have a future passive indicative? So this is a statement of fact about the future that something's going to happen to the speaker. 
So Paul knows he's going to continue to be caused to rejoice. <laughs> this is not easy grammar, folks. <laughs> if you thought the grammar was going to be easy, this is not where this is going to go. Because I know this will lead to my uh, salvation or vindication. So let's, let's lean into page 68 here for just a second. Uh, so what are, again, Paul's options that he's facing? He's either facing guilty or innocent, right? So let's let Dr. Uh, Hansen lean into this. Whether he lives or dies, whether he's executed or released, Paul is determined to rejoice. Like, I don't know how often it happens, but I don't think it's very often that I wake up in the morning and look at my calendar and go, I am determined to rejoice in this. Do y'all do that very often? Because it, like, it's not a habit of mine. Um, I have become acutely aware of it in the last few weeks. Uh, he's determined to rejoice. The prospect of his trial drove him to prayer, but it did not drive him to despair. Like, all right, the, the Baptisty came out in him right there, right? So you got to tuck that in a little. Um, his joy did not depend on the prospect of keeping his life, but on honoring Christ, whether by life or by death. Because his decision to rejoice whether he lived or died was not completely irrational. It was based on knowledge. The knowledge of his deliverance. Right? There was a, uh, a scene in a funeral that was publicly shown a couple of years ago. And a preacher was talking about his mom who had had cancer. And he said, it took me way too long to realize she was either going to be saved or saved. She was either going to be healed or healed. And Paul understands here that like, like there's a knowledge component to his faith. Because we in America have this belief that like belief and faith and hope and all these things are like, well, these are just like fairy tale things. They're not based in any reality. Oh, no, 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 no. There's a, there's a root here because Paul says on, on verse 19 on page 68 here, because there's a reason for this, I know. Perfect active indicative. Something's happened in the past. I believe it. It's a statement of fact that's continuing until now. So a couple of applications here. Christians rejoice because of what the gospel has done and will do. Christians rejoice because of what the gospel has done and will do. Christians rejoice because of what the gospel has done and will do. So what do we do because of that? It, if it sounds really simple, it is. Yes, rejoice. Yes, I have it in all caps and an exclamation point on mine. <laughs> rejoice. Yes, absolutely. Another application here, the gospel results in knowledge about the future. It's crazy that we know stuff that hasn't happened yet. Like, you just, just think about that for a second. We know stuff that hasn't happened yet. You go tell the average person on the street that they will escort you to the nearest uh, mental facility. And like, there is something weird about that. But we know stuff that hasn't happened yet. So what do we do with that? We rejoice. This is great. <laughs> what a wonderful system God has allowed us to participate in. Because <laughs> he could have kept us completely in the dark the entire time. Right, the entire time. So application one on that page, Christians rejoice because of what the gospel has done and will do. Application two, the gospel results in knowledge about the future. So don't lean out, don't, don't lean away from that. Like lean into that. Like that's, that's amazing good stuff. All right, so verse 19, so because I know this, this is a demonstrative pronoun, I know this will lead to my salvation. Now, there's something that we don't see on the surface here, but if you had a study Bible, there would very likely be a reference from this phrase, this will lead to my salvation, to Job. Does anybody have a study Bible with a reference to Job there? If you don't, it's okay, because this is a tough one to see. So I gotta, I gotta back up just a second. So. What language was the New Testament originally given in? Greek. Yes, good. I, 
I really hope you guys got that one right. <laughs> I don't know what we've been doing if you didn't get that one right. <laughs> this might not be the class for you if you missed that one. <laughs> um, just got to go. What language was the Old Testament originally, what language was the majority of the Old Testament originally given in? Hebrew, Hebrew with a smidge of Aramaic. There you go. Good. Uh, did everybody in New Testament times speak Hebrew? No, of course not. So what did they do? Some religious scholars got together and they translated the Old Testament into Greek. And what was the name for that document? The Septuagint, yes, because the rumor is there were 70 people who did this. And what we know is that Paul sometimes borrows very direct quotes from the Septuagint that if you put the Hebrew next to it, you're like, yeah, it's a really good translation of that. This phrase, this will lead to my salvation, is a direct quote, exact, letter for letter, from the Septuagint translation of Job chapter 13. So let's flip over to Job chapter 13. Anybody read Job lately? It is stunningly depressing. I got in my head I was going to teach through Job once. And then I read Job. And I decided I wanted to teach the first two chapters and the last three chapters. <laughs> because the middle 9,622 chapters are just chocked full of heinous, hideous, horrible, very bad, no good theology. Like Job, every once in a while, getting like a little glimmer of like, yay, that was good. And his friends just espousing every form of Christian awfulness that you can imagine. Like, Everything you have ever engaged, like bad Christianity, shows up in Job in some form or fashion. And every once in a while, Job's like, I think I see something good. And yes, and, and a high point of Job is Job chapter 13, where Job talks about uh, what God is going to do to him because of how Job sees Job. So uh, start at verse uh, 13 here. It says, uh, be quiet. So he's talking to his friends who have now, like, in the colloquial phrase, really ticked him off because they did a good job the first week. They just shut up. And then they opened their mouths and started lecturing him, and they were wrong. And Job is wrong a lot as we go through Job as well. So don't, I don't want to miss that. But in verse 13, he's, he's kind of had enough, and this is the teapot like starting to squeal a little. You see a little of this here. He says, be quiet, and I will speak. Like, he is mourning the loss of basically everything in his life, and his friends won't shut up. So this is, this is a great lesson to learn right here. Be quiet, and I will speak. Let whatever comes happen to me. I will put myself at risk and take my life in my own hands. Even if he kills me, I will hope in him. Who's the he here? God. I will still defend my ways before him. Yes, this will result in my deliverance. This is the line that Paul is quoting. For no godless person can appear before him. This is Job's hope in the future as well as the present. See, Job's doing both, actually, right here. And I think this is why Paul may be doing both. Because Paul quotes a line from Job where he's actually doing both the present and in the future. Uh, verse 18, Now then, I have prepared my case. I know that I am right. Can anyone indict me? If so, I will be silent and die. There's no exaggeration or hyperbole in Job's speech whatsoever, right? Only grant these two things to me, God, so that I will not have to hide from your presence. Remove your hand from me and do not let your terror frighten me. Does that get granted to Job at the end of the book? His terror, like, his, Job's terror level is high at the end of Job when God is like, I will show you who I am now, Job. You will be quiet and watch. <laughs> Um, then call and I will answer or I will speak and you can respond to me. How many iniquities and sins have I committed? Reveal to me my transgression and sin. Why do you hide your face and consider me your enemy? Will you frighten a wind-driven leaf? Will you chase after dry straw? For, your, for you record bitter accusations against me and make me inherit my, the iniquities of my youth. You put my feet in the stocks. Prison language, anyone? And stand watch over all my paths, setting a limit for the soles of my feet. A person wears out like something rotten, like a moth-eaten garment. Like, what in the world? 
why is Paul quoting this? Because Paul is relating to Job and Job's situation right here. He's got friends around him that are sometimes saying really stupid things, and that's the situation Paul's in. He's got brothers around him that are sometimes doing things for really stupid reasons, and he's appealing to God for his own deliverance. So that's why I think it can be both. Because of a Bible reference. This stuff is hard. <laughs> this is not easy. All right, so back on page 69. This will lead, future middle indicative, this is a statement of fact, to my salvation through your prayers. All right, so bottom of page 69, one application, one personalization real quick. So an application here, um, I would argue that authors can mean more than one thing at a time. I, I don't think we should read the Bible assuming this is always true, but I do think authors can mean more than one thing at a time. Um, what was the population of the church at Philippi? Were they primarily... Uh, more Greek, like Roman, or are they primarily more Jewish? Be more Roman, right? That's the audience that they would have come from. Do you think the Roman population of Philippi is going to catch a quote from an obscure Old Testament book in a translation they most likely would never have? Like, no. This is, like, there are going to be very few people that are going to pick up on this. Paul's cool with that because Jesus was cool with it. Jesus did it all the time, actually. So authors can mean more than one thing at a time. So personalization, I would say keep an open hand, especially with the unclear. Right? I don't want to... <laughs> I love studying the Bible because there are parts where I go, oh, wow, that, we can like dive into this and be a thousand percent confident that this is right. And then there are parts where you go, I think I should back away a little slowly on this one. I don't know that that's as clear as it, I thought it was. And the crazy thing is the clear parts are Jesus. <laughs> it's like, if you get through Philippians and you're not sure Paul is sold out on Jesus, then you, we, hadn't, we haven't been paying attention. All right, so we'll lead to my salvation through your prayers and help from the Spirit of Jesus Christ. We will probably end with the word prayers up here today because I want to look up a couple of verses. All right, so... At this table right here, you got Romans 15, 30 through 32. That table back there, 2 Corinthians 1, 10 and 11. Table back there, Colossians 4, 2 through 4. And then up here, 1 Thessalonians 5, 25. All right. I want to show you a habit Paul had in his letters, and it will be stunningly, incredibly obvious after about two verses that we read. All right, so Romans 15, 30 through 32. Okay. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. Was Paul okay with asking prayer for himself? I would say he bordered on commanding it. <laughs> like, okay, cool. One, one stroke in the evidence column. What about 2 Corinthians 1, 10 and 11? So, asking for prayer, excellent, right? Colossians 4, 2 through 4. Devote yourselves to prayer. Devote yourselves to what? Prayer. You know, it's a phenomenal Bible study to go through the Bible and look for the things that the Bible tells us to devote ourselves to. It is a shockingly small list of things. So, devote yourselves to prayer. Just any, like, generic prayer for whatever you want, right? 
Or what? I keep, I'm sorry, it was rhetorical. Sarcasm. <laughs> So is Paul asking for prayer for Paul to consume for Paul's benefit? No, it's a little broader than that, isn't it? It's, it's not just generic prayer for Paul. It's not like, just pray for me, brothers. No, pray for me that the gospel will go forth. Pray for me that we will be strengthened. Pray for me that we'll have opportunities. And he's going to get into here, pray that, that I am not ashamed. Because there's a trial coming up. And he's going to have an opportunity to say something that would disgrace the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we don't think about Paul in that way very often. Like, what was he? he was always just like, well, look what he asked him to pray for. Kind of tips your hat toward what's on his heart, what he believes about things, right? All right, so we got uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.25. There you go. <laughs> I figured we'd land on that one. <laughs> Brothers, pray for us. Pray for us. Pray for us. Pray for us. Um, and I think that's about as good a segue as I can have to our prayer time today. So, <laughs> uh, so if you have something that you would like prayer for, we would like to pray for you so that we can imitate our brother Paul who asked for prayer so that he could go and fulfill the work that God had for him. This is a helpful thing. God did not give us brothers and sisters to like, keep at a distance. We have a family to engage with. So uh, let's go into our prayer time. You should have a weekly update, so make sure your name's at the bottom uh, of one side, and then there's prayer requests on the other. And uh, we have plenty of time this morning to share prayer requests and to pray. And next week, Lord willing, we'll talk about what in the world the Spirit of Jesus Christ is. It's fun stuff. So we'll go there next week. But uh, with that, I think that concludes our lesson for today. So thanks for attending. Thanks for those of you that are online as well. And uh, we'll go into our prayer time now. Thanks, guys. Thanks for engaging. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast, YouTube channel, and weekly email. You can subscribe to all three of those at OurSundaySchool.com. Grace and peace to you.